Yolanda Renteria is a trauma therapist and licensed professional counselor in private practice in Arizona. She is trained in EMDR, somatic experiencing, brain spotting, and dialectical behavior therapy. She'll define all of those after the event. <laughs> she also provides somatic processing sessions, psychoeducational workshops, and speaking services. Um, Yolanda is passionate about helping people break generational cycles and thrive in parenting and relationships. She's also an adjunct faculty professor, excuse me, faculty psychology professor at Northern Arizona University, a contributor for the Gottman Institute and Very Well Mind. Some of her work has been featured in Selena Gomez's Wonder Mind, Parents Latina, and NPR. And she utilizes effectively social media platforms to bring awareness of generational cycles that perpetuate trauma. It's my true pleasure to introduce our new best friend, Yolanda Renteria. Gosh, it's so nice to be here. I did a workshop this morning, and there's something about this city, the soul of it. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. So I want to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. A lot of the information that I talk about, not only do I talk about what, what the experiences are like for other people, but from my own personal perspective and personal work. Today's topic come from that, comes from that lens. I want to ask you, do you have any memories of your mother looking at you when you were a child? And I know that as I ask that question, for a lot of you, all of your brains are probably scanning for memories automatically. Some of you, because you have a lot of memories, they come up rather quickly. Some of you might have struggled a little bit more. And then there were some of you whose brain is still scanning for those memories. If you are part of one of the last two groups, I want to tell you that this is very common. A lot of us were raised by generations of parents and grandparents who were emotionally disconnected. Parents who didn't know how to connect to their kids because they were not connected themselves. And a lot of the times, they try to do their best. They try to break cycles. They try to show up better for their kids. But a lot of our parents didn't know what was missing. A lot of parents didn't know about attachment and all of the information we have now. How do we learn about connection? You probably have heard a lot about attachment. I like to talk about emotional connection just because to me, it's more clear than attachment, and it might be different for you, but to me, emotional connection is the connection that I feel to other people, the connection that I feel to the spaces that I'm in, the connection that I feel to my children, to my grandchildren. When we're babies, we're learning about the world. We're born as pretty much blank slates, yes, genes play a role, so there are certain things that we're predisposed to be But, but in reality, a lot of things in our environment are teaching us what the world looks like. So as babies, we thrive on predictability and comfort. If we have parents who are showing up predictively, then that means that somebody cares enough about what we need to show up and try to make it better. And it doesn't have to be perfect. People don't have to meet our needs consistently in order for us to feel that they care. It is when people don't show up and they're really unpredictable that we learn from a very young age that we can't trust people to be there. Those early connections determine what we believe about people. 
and it is a very unconscious process, and then it becomes a very unconscious process later on, when in our relationships, we have this sense that trusting people does not feel safe. As we're growing up, we connect through play. We connect through attention. And I've had some people tell me, I wasn't that kid. I didn't need attention. I didn't need anyone to play with me. I was okay on my own. And although there are some people for whom that is true, especially for neurodivergent neuro, um, people, the reality is that most of us did try to get the attention and play from the adults around us because that helped us feel connected. What a lot of that times happened was that from a very young age, we stopped trying because no one was coming. And a lot of our memories, if you, if you know about memory, the creation of memories, you know that a lot of the memories that we remember tend to be after three years of age. So you only have to think about what that would look like for somebody to stop trying to connect to someone before they're three. So even though we may not have a memory of that, it doesn't mean that the body doesn't remember. And of course, when we're teenagers, a lot of the connection that we seek is through approval. We want the approval of our peers, you know, who hasn't dyed their hair a certain way, or I don't know, if, if you're like me, I try to paint my room black. They, my parents didn't let me. <laughs> that was the limit, but yeah, social inclusion, feeling like you belong. Human beings are wired for connection, and we want to feel like we belong. Disconnection or rejection is isolating, and human beings tend to pursue that desire for connection. Now, if these things were not met, if we learned from a young age that connection wasn't safe, then what does that look like in adulthood? Some people tend to find careers or do things that help them feel seen. So maybe it is a career choice where they're in the spotlight, where they're a, a speaker on a national on an event, or they are in positions of power or, or leadership because they want people to listen. They want people to see them. And other times, they develop the opposite which is, I don't want to be seen because being seen and heard is painful, so I just find ways to avoid connection, right? And that's by being quiet, maybe overworking, being the lone wolf. So you have these two extremes, like somebody who's always doing. Also for the people who, who want to be seen, sometimes they do through doing. What can I do for you? Because in that way, we're trying to meet our needs for connection. So let's go over some things, some telltale signs of what disconnection looks like and what to do. When someone is emotionally disconnected, they're more likely to be less patient, more irritable, and easy, they quick to anger. They try to avoid, you know, activities that require patient, patience. This is a really interesting one, too, with loved ones, around loved ones. A lot of impatience. One of the things I heard a lot was the impatience, like how, how people feel irritable around their parents. 
And this was, to me, such a big sign of disconnection. When people are around their parents and they don't understand why, they have this pool to be connected to their parents, but when they're around their parents, they're breathing and they're already irritated. Right? And then I see some nods. <laughs> This is such a common experience, and some people experience that internal conflict because I want to be close to you, but I can't stand you. I can't stand being around you. And some people experience a lot of guilt over it, and other people have the awareness that this is happening, but they just don't know how to change it. How do I change this? Why does this happen? When we are in these states, our nervous system is dysregulated. We are on fight flight. If you've heard about that, it's a protective response. And a lot of people who are emotionally disconnected are always on edge. They're not in the present moment. And so anything that happens, quickly triggers this reaction. So it seems like I'm reacting to what's happening, when in reality, in my body, I already feel the disconnection. I already feel impatient and irritable. And when anyone does anything, it just puts me over the edge. Working on nervous system regulation here is key and is the foundation of emotional connection. You cannot connect to someone if, you, if your body is on fight flight. It's impossible. Sometimes we are out there and we're playing with our kids. We're on fight flight. We're doing an activity and we're not enjoying it. They are doing something or they're showing us something. And no matter how much we want to enjoy it, we can't get ourselves to. We can't get ourselves to be excited about what they're doing. It is because we're disconnected from what's happening. Number two, people, people who are emotionally disconnected tend to be stuck on logical thinking. And one of, the, one of the signs or one of the things I see when I'm working with people and I can tell there's emotionally disconnection is that they will try to rationalize their emotions. <laughs> and they spend the whole hour talking, and I mean, I'm guilty of this, okay? I'm not judging anyone. They will, they will spend the whole hour talking about how to make things better, but they will hardly ever Emote, meaning they won't cry. They can be talking about something really traumatic that happened, and they can tell you how awful it was, but you can tell that they're not feeling it in their body. The body gets used to analyzing emotions when it's unsafe to feel them. So what do we do? We practice feeling emotions. <laughs> and this is really hard when we're not used to feeling emotions. In fact, I remember the, the question that I asked at the beginning, right, of has your, do you have any memories of your mom looking at you in the eyes? That was the exact, the exact question I was asked when I was doing one of my EMDR sessions. And when I was doing that session, I was like, I had a really good childhood. What are you talking about? <laughs> I was a happy child. I'm just here because I'm practicing because I, I want to, you know, do EMDR with my clients. And I wasn't getting anywhere. I was sitting down. If you're familiar with EMDR, you know, you, you do the eye movements. And I think I, think I probably, you know, uh, my therapist kind of either knew what was happening or she was getting a little impatient with me because it wasn't going anywhere. And when she asked that question, all of the memories came up. I suddenly went back to a memory of being in a room by myself. I must have been four or five years old. And this memory was so unique to me because I felt 
the sense of loneliness, even though I grew up in a big family and I was always around people. Emotional connection has nothing to do with being surrounded by people. It's how you feel internally when you're surrounded by people that matters. A lot of us learned that feeling emotions was not safe. And we have to teach ourselves that it is safe to feel emotions now. And it is not an easy job. It is a very vulnerable job, and your body will push against it. I've literally had people whom I work with have panic attacks when they felt themselves about to cry. This is how intense this early wiring is. So as we do this work, it requires a lot of patience, but we can build it. We can build emotional connection to have more satisfying relationships. One thing that you can do is start naming the emotion as you feel it in your body. And a lot of us are used to naming really basic emotions, right? Happiness, I'm sad, happy, angry. For some of us, like angry might be the most constant emotion or irritated, frustrated. There are lists that you can find online if you Google it that will give you a list of different emotions. And learning to name your emotions out of that can help you give language to what's happening internally. And at first, it's, at first it's gonna feel really fake, okay? It's gonna feel like I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling disappointed. But the more that you do it, it's like a muscle. You start building your capacity to identify what's going on. A lot, also, the other thing with this is that oftentimes people who are emotionally disconnected are not curious enough about other people's experiences. They're focused a lot on their own experience. There is a lack of empathy because there is a lack of connection. When we feel connected, we can feel into the other person's experiences. When we're disconnected, it is really easy not to feel. Sometimes some people will even say, like, I got really bad news. Like, somebody told me a horrible thing that happened to them, and, you know, I just, like, was them, and I said the right thing, but I didn't feel anything. And we often don't talk about these things because there's so much shame around it. Or even the loss of something big in our lives. It might be painful in the moment, but for some people who are so emotionally disconnected, they don't feel the depth of the pain. And not that I want you to go and feel the depth of all of the pains, but what happens is that if we don't feel the pain, we don't process it. And just like we block the painful emotions, a lot of the times our body also blocks the pleasant emotions. When we have emotions, emotions happy, happen in the body, emotions carry energy, movement, and you'll notice body sensa sensations. So be looking out for those things as you're practicing naming your emotions. People who are emotionally disconnected might not feel that, right? But as you begin to connect again, you will start noti notice things moving. One of the safest emotions to feel is anxiety or, or nervousness. And I mean, what I mean by that is because we might not speak about it, but we can feel it because it feels really intense. And a lot of people feel it on their stomach or on their jaw, right? And in somatic work, we practice that a lot. Jaw or stomach or, or, or um, legs. Some people feel a lot of weakness in their legs when they're nervous. So just pay attention to those things. Implementing mindfulness, and mindfulness is just body awareness, is really key in this. A 
adrenaline highs. When we are emotionally disconnected, we will try to look for things that make us feel something. Scrolling social media is something that right now a lot of people do because it gives you a dopamine hit. Anytime you're looking at something you enjoy, you're getting a dopamine hit. The body wants to feel. Overachieving. Have you ever seen, or maybe you are that person who's always setting goal? You know, one of the things that my professor in, when I was doing my master program said was, there, like, you will never be satisfied with life if you're always looking at things in the future. Like, your happiness is somewhere in the future. I will be happy when I graduate. I don't have to do any homework or late nights. I will be happy when I get my first good job. I will be happy when I get married. I will be happy when I get the house. What we're looking for is the chemicals that we get from those experiences. Because in the in-betweens, which is life, we don't get a lot of stimulation. And this is what this work is about. About learning to enjoy the in-betweens. How, how present are you to your life? How much are you enjoying the things that happen today? When you woke up this morning and had breakfast, did you rush through it? Were you mindful of what was happening? When your friend sent you a text to say, I hope that you're having a good day, did you just read it, reply, thank you, you too? But did you absorb what they said? What it means to have somebody send you a message to just let you know that they care? They're thinking about you? A lot of the times we're rushing through all of these moments and we're not connected to them. And adrenaline highs, just like constant change, remodeling, buying new things, buying expensive things, buying the latest thing, um, the Stanley Cup, everything gives us a feeling of adrenaline. And now, mind you, I'm not saying that you shouldn't like these things. It's okay. It's okay to like these things. The problem is when that's all we're doing. So one thing we can do here is set limits for ourselves, for how much we buy, for, for the activities that we engage us to look for these highs. And in the in-betweens, practice being present and just enjoying the present moment, the simple moments. That's what life is. Life is the simple moments. The person who smiles to you on the street when they're walking, Looking at the dog, I, today I saw a dog with little shoes. <laughs> Paying attention to the waiter when she's handing you your food. Life is the little moments. It is not the highs. The highs add to our life. Another thing that when we're emotionally disconnected, we tend to do unconsciously is push away from relationships, shut down emotionally. There are some people who take pride in that because it's an unconscious process, right? Of like, I can depend on myself. I, I don't need anyone. I'm happy by myself. I like my time. One of the things that I find though consistently and pe I'm, I'm lucky to, that people share with me, is that even when being alone is safer, so I'd rather be alone, I still want somebody to care. It still feels good when somebody sends me a message to see how I'm doing. Because we are wired for connection, being disconnected from others is painful. 
In this step, we want to identify people who are safe to start practicing getting closer to people. But in order to, to identify people, we have to know what safety looks like. Because guess what? A lot of us don't have a pattern of safe people. A lot of us have a lot of people in our life who have been the same way with us, and we are used to that pattern. So sometimes it might be that we can't even connect to the people we know now. And we have to find safe people slowly because it is only in that way that we learn the different relationships are possible, the different type of connection is possible. Who's a gift giver <laughs> or an acts of service? I am, I am. I learn acts of service from my mom. I will be the person who goes put gas, you know, in your car so you don't have to do it. Um, yeah, I'm that, I guess I will say I'm recovering from that. This is so common in emotional disconnection because people want connection and when they give a gift or when they do something for someone, it feels good. It, you release oxytocin when you do those things and it makes you feel that you're connecting to someone. However, the connection is only temporary if you feel emotionally disconnected. It is not about not doing these things. It's about noticing what happens in our body when we do these things and how long that feeling lasts. When you do things for other people, notice how your body feels. Look at their expression. Look at the joy that you just created in that moment. And take that in. That is what life is about. There is a beautiful thing that happens when, when we do either words of affirmation, acts of kindness, expressing love, expressing, expressing um, through gifts. But we don't take them in fully sometimes. So it's a practice. Okay. This one is, is really hard. And I have a personal story for this one vulnerability, and opening up to other people. I went to San Diego to the beach with a friend. I, it feels like I'm an open book, okay? I'm always like talking about things and sharing things. So people feel like they know me, right? And this was some years ago. And I, and she, she had shared some really deep things with me. We had a good connection. But we're in, we're, when we were sitting at the, bit, at the beach, I said, have you ever noticed that I never share anything really personal with you? And she was shocked. She thought we were having all these, all, all these deep conversations, but I was telling her the things that were safe to feel. <laughs> that it was, it's safe for me to tell you that I'm so embarrassed about something that happened, but it is not safe to tell you what's going on in my relationships. It's not safe to tell you how I don't feel like I'm the greatest mom, right? And the thing that happens is that when we shut down those parts, we're shutting down connection, especially if it's with a dear friend, a close relationship, or our partners. And we do so much of this in our relationships. It has never felt safe to share with so much vulnerability because we have experiences where things have not been safe to share and when deep emotions have not been safe to feel. A lot of us grew up having parents 
who were quick to shut down emotions. It is not a big deal. You're too sensitive. It's not that bad. Get over it. Practicing opening up and Obviously, you don't have to go and share your whole life story with someone. But practice opening up with what feels safe right now. What is something small that you can share? And I'm going to give you an example. You can let someone know if something made you feel good. In that moment, if, if somebody did something nice for you, you, you can thank them, but also tell them, that felt really good. I really like that. See? Like, we don't have to share all of our secrets at once. But we're practicing vulnerability through small acts. Physical touch and I love yous. Remember when I said that I, I thought my, my childhood was perfect? <laughs> And I was just a therapist because I wanted to help other people because I grew up fine. Well, this was one of the things that was like a hard truth. It took me a long time to realize that I never really had any hugs or kisses from my mom. Or I never heard her say, I love you. Now, mind you, I have the best relationship with my mom. I love her dearly. This is not an attack on her. But she was not used to hearing that either. There was no one hugging her when she was five, six years old cooking the meals for all of her brothers. She learned to tell me that she loved me through doing things for me. And although that's amazing, the things that we didn't get, we repeat unless we're aware that they're also important. And a lot of us who are emotionally disconnected, we're not used to it. And what, what you'll find is that it feels weird to say them. When I used to hug my son, I have a 14-year-old, and I practiced this when he was from a young age, not as young as I would have wished. But I remember my body feeling tense. And if you've never heard about mirror neurons, even though you're hugging someone, it doesn't mean that they feel the connection if your body is tense, okay? If you're on fight flight, they're feeling the stiffness. So I had to do a lot of practice of relaxing my body, taking deep, deep breathing, doing deep breathing, just so that I could come back to a space of connection so we could begin the work of connection. And that's the work we can do because thankfully we have the ability to change things. Our body, I don't know if you're familiar with the term neuroplasticity, our brain has the capacity to change our connections, but it can only change connections through the experiences that we're exposed to. It won't happen magically. But because we're so used to the connections we have now, we'll feel some resistance as we're trying to change. That's expected and that's okay. I promise the more that you practice, the easier it gets. This is something that I've done with my son and now I'm doing with my mother. Rebuilding that, con I'm gonna get emotional here. <laughs> Rebuilding that connection has been something so beautiful. Being able to tell her, hey, you didn't get these things. I'm new at it too. But we're practicing. And I'm practicing taking it in. And from that, I've noticed that my reactions have decreased with her. I'm not so, I'm not so irritable around her. I'm more patient. That's what connection does. Because you can't be mean to someone you feel connected to. 
I will, I will say that it doesn't mean that you will always feel connected to people. It is normal to sometimes experience disconnection. It is okay for you to get mad and, feel, and be disconnected in that moment. It is when we always feel disconnected or where we spend most of the time feeling disconnected that it becomes a problem because we never feel satisfied in our lives, in our relationships, at any work that we have, in experiences, there is just always something that's missing. Asking for help. I remember that, and it's not only my experience, this is something that's so common for a lot of the people who I've met. And it's that we want to do it all. I don't need any help. I can figure it out on my own. But then you start building resentment because people aren't doing things. I do all of these things and no one cares or no one helps me or nobody's showing up the way that I'm showing up. I remember I had a, I had, um, I was speaking with, I was speaking with a client once and I, was, and I asked, let me, and I said, let me ask you something. When you're telling your kids that they don't help you, right? You're, you're yelling and saying like, oh, you never help me. And then they offer. What do you do? <laughs> and she paused. It was like, because a lot of the times when the help comes, in that moment, we push it away. No, no, I got it, I got it. I don't need it anymore. Why do I, why do I have to ask you? Why, does, why isn't it something that you just want to do on your own, right? We'll find a way to reject the help. So what do we do? So we start leaning in. We recognize that we have needs too. And when, it, when help shows up, we take it. We know that we don't have to be the ones doing the thing all the time. It is okay to let somebody else carry the thing that we've been carrying. Sometimes we have learned from very early on that no one was showing up, that we had to do it if, because no one else was going to do it for us. Or we might have learned that other people were always carrying the thing. Maybe our parents, we had a parent who was always carrying the thing, and we learned that that's the way that you're supposed to be. But no, there is another way, and it feels so much better. And the last one is apologizing and repairing. When we think about apologizing, or when we think about someone apologizing to us, what is our experience, right? Somebody did something to us and it was painful and then they recognize it. We feel connected in that moment because we feel understood, we feel validated, we feel seen. But for a lot of us, it really is difficult acknowledging that we've done something wrong or seeing or understanding another person, sometimes we receive messages that apologizing was weak. So a lot of the times we learn that it's easier to just move on from things rather than fix them. And we do this with our kids all the time too. I think we do it we do it in general with a lot of people, but with our kids especially, it's like kids don't deserve apologies, right? Because adults are always right. When we apologize and we repair, we make a promise that we're going to try to do something to improve the relationship. And that builds trust in relationships. That lets the other person know that you care about the relationship. And that doesn't happen when you just move on without repair.
that is it for tonight. I hope that you found this helpful. We're going to move on to do a Q&A. Thank you so much for your time.